Welcome to each and every one of you who joined this T7 Japan inception. We are happy to announce the official launch of Japan's T7 hosting with this event. In this two hour event, we hope to share you the roadmap for T7, a G7 think tank engagement group to be chaired by the Asian Development Bank Institute or ADBI as part of Japan's G7 2023 presidency. We will open with the remarks from the T7 Japan lead chair and ADBI Dean Tetsunobe, who will walk you through the T7 Japan agenda and its focus. You can find more on the speaker's biographies in the agenda, which we are now posting in the chat. Please welcome Dean Sonobe. Okay, thank you, Kaori. Uh, good evening from Tokyo, everyone. Warm welcome to T7 2023 Inception Conference. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us to see what T7 will be, who are participating in it, whether T7 can help the earth become a better place, and whether T7 can deserve your valuable time. As you know, T7 is a think tank engagement group of G7. Its history is short because it started toward the end of the last year in Germany under German's G7 presidency. Earlier this year, T7 participants produced 70 policy briefs, several issue papers, and one communique. And the communique was handed over to Chancellor Scholz toward the end of May by the lead co-chairs of T7 Germany, Dr. Anna Katarina Honich and Dr. Dennis Snow. So T7 is turning two years old and the lack of long history allows you and I to learn together what T7 should do and how to approach the ideal shape of T7. If we just repeat the same thing next year uh, that we did with T7 Germany early this year, we cannot learn much. So we want to have some experience, experiments deviating from the previous T7, even though we at the same time emphasize the importance of continuity because uh, excessive deviation will also make learning difficult. So T7 Japan will have some experiments and uh, our findings will be utilized to make T7 Italy 2024 better than T7 Japan 2023. For the next few, or well, maybe several minutes, I'd like to explain what should uh, remain the same and what should be experimented. First, we should remain the same. It's uh, what we should remain the same is to play the role of policy think tanks. That is bridging research and policy making to guide policy makers and the public to informed decision making. Second, T7 Germany was open to non G7 member countries and inclusive, trying to include participants from the global south. And T7 Japan should remain the same. It remains open to think tanks and university researchers from across the world. To better bridge research and policy making, we should listen to insights held by any think tank or university researchers, whether they are in developed or developing countries. Third, and turning to experiments or deviations, we reduce the number of task forces from five to four and reduce the number of policy briefs to be produced from 
70 to 16, 16, or only four from each task force. By doing so, policy briefs will be more likely to be read by policy makers and also task force co-chairs uh, burden will be reduced. Instead, three task force co-chairs of each task force will pour much energy and time to produce one issue paper together, which is not just summary of policy briefs made in the task force, but more original contribution. Fourth, in selecting task force co-chairs, this T7 requires each task force to include at least one co-chair from the Global South and one female co-chair. Uh, we are also encouraging uh, colleagues in Africa, Latin America, Central Asia, Middle East, and other global regions from which we do not see many participants in the previous T7 and the T20. So, uh, but we will try harder in this direction, uh, meaning uh, making T7 more open and inclusive. But uh, for continuity, however, we also emphasize as a requirement or criteria in selection of task force co-chairs. So each task force to, should include at least one co-chair who has rich experience of active participation in the past T20 and the T7 processes. Fifth, uh, because I mentioned policy briefs and issue papers, let me go back to continuity. So the T7 website, uh, that is www.think7.org, uh, has a publication section in which those documents, uh, I mean, the policy briefs, issue papers, as well as uh, communique, are uh, available. But T7 Japan Secretariat, that is ADB Institute, uh, we make these documents uh, produced by the previous T7 uh, easier to find and read. So we are uh, going to improve the T7 website, web page, uh, so that uh, you can easily find the previous uh, you know, documents. And then the sixth, T7 would like to listen to the voice from the global south uh, to be more inclusive, and then get insights and the policy uh, recommendation uh, based on research results obtained from the global south to inform G7 leaders. So task force one uh, is entirely devoted to the issues of sustainable, inclusive, and resilient development in the global south. So I will leave the introduction of other task forces to a later part of this event. But uh, please uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, T7 Japan is trying to be more uh, you know, inclusive and open. And then uh, maybe sevens, T7 Japan will work closely with T20 India. So many people or well, almost everybody agrees that uh, G7 and uh, G20 should work closely to make the us better, better place to live. But uh, how? That's a problem. Maybe T7 and the T20 can bridge G7 and the G20 as a kind of uh, you know forum or forum to for discussion of those uh, global issues, and then to you know make communication between G7 leaders and the non-G7, G20 member uh, country leaders. So by doing so, T7 and the T20 can contribute to the peace 
and also better global governance in the world. So for that purpose, uh, uh, G T7 Japan and T20 India should work together. And also the many participants in T7 and T20 are the same people. So that's why the coordination is really needed. Otherwise, there may be the you know, T7 event and T20 events uh, dealing with uh, almost the same issue in the same week. So that kind of uh, you know, inefficient uh, time uh, management can take place. So T7 Japan and T20 India will work closely. This is also something new. And then one thing I should mention is that the ADB Institute is a multilateral organization. It's not a think tank of uh, Japan, but uh, with the endorsement of the Japanese government, ADB Institute or ADBI is hosting T7 Japan. The main reason why ADB Institute is uh, working on T7, pouring a lot of uh, our resources uh, and time, uh, human resources, and also finance to T7 process, is that uh, it's uh, almost completely or you know perfectly fit our mission uh, to help developing countries. Even though uh, ADBI is uh, uh, kind of, working on Asia and the Pacific, not the other global regions, but uh, you know, listening to the uh, voice from global south and then um, conveying uh, the message or maybe after digesting and then conveying message to the policy leaders is our mission. Uh, so the T7 that started in Germany and uh, Germany, uh, German uh, T7 was open and inclusive. That's why uh, a a ADBI uh, is so happy to succeed and then uh, to, you know, if possible, uh, improve it and then hand it over to uh, Italy. So that's uh, kind of our pleasure and also uh that's uh, honor uh to do so this is a reason and then the t7 japan's mission or our, our slogan is of course we will make a kind of policy proposal or recommendation based on research based on science and also we are think tank so the think you know out of the box thinking is very much emphasized. And then uh, what we want to do is to address crises and then reignite the sustainable development because we are facing lots of uh, crises, uh, debt crisis, uh, food crisis, uh, energy crisis. So we hope to uh, contribute to the you know finding and also implementing solutions to these issues, these problems. At the same time, uh, in view of the kind of slowdown of the lots of effort toward the sustainable de development goals, uh, it is very important to reignite the move toward uh, the sustainable development. So addressing crisis and reigniting sustainable development is the uh, very important uh, kind of uh, purpose of T7 Japan. And uh, if we add one more, uh, maybe I would choose select this uh, slogan, uh, bridging G7 and the G20. So by or through the cross collaboration uh, between T7 Japan and uh, T20 India. So after my, right after my speech, or maybe after uh, taking a group photo, 
uh, we will have, uh, have a kind of discussion with uh, T20 India colleagues. So let's ask uh, their view uh, at the time. But before that, uh, we are very happy uh, to have uh, Ambassador Kazo, uh, Kazuhiko Nakamura. So I'm very honored to welcome Ambassador Kazuhiko Nakamura uh, to join this inception. Ambassador Nakamura is uh, Deputy Director General, uh, economic, uh, in charge of economic affairs. But uh, kind of very importantly in the context of T7, he is a Su Sherpa uh, of G7 and G20. So please welcome Ambassador uh, Nakamura. Ambassador, uh, floor is yours. Please unmute and start. Thank you very much uh, for your introduction. And uh, let me start uh, by congratulating uh, on behalf of the government of Japan, you all, uh, the holding of this T7 inception conference under the ADB uh, Institute chair. I thank uh, Director Sonobe and other members of ADBI for providing the opportunity to make remarks as an incoming G7 presidency. T7 has contributed to the G7 discussions under the German presidency this year, and of course, uh, under the preceding presidency uh, during the uh, as many pre preceding years. And I expect that T7 will continue to do the same as an engagement group of the G7 next year. Uh, when, he, when we have a kind of review and look back uh, this past year under the German presidency, uh, we all uh, witnessed that Russia's aggression against Ukraine shook the very foundations of the international order. This is not only a security issue for Europe, but also for the world as a whole. Furthermore, it has caused or aggravated a food and energy crisis in the world and has also had a negative impact on climate change countermeasures, nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation uh, causing problems in various fields. At the same time, unilateral attempts to change the status quo by force in uh, many parts of the world, including in the East China Sea and South China Sea, as well as North Korea's ongoing nuclear and missile development are putting uh, the region where we are in, uh, Japan is in, East Asia, in a critical situation. At such a major era-defining turning point, coordination in the international community, coordination among the uh, major partners in the international community, I should say, have never been more important. This year, the G7 has played in this context a pivotal role, I believe, in such coordination through a series of high-level meetings in an unprecedented frequency. Under such circumstances, Japan at the G7 Hiroshima summit intends to demonstrate G7's commitment to upholding the international order based on the rule of law. The expected outcomes of the G7 Hiroshima summit will be elaborated in consultation with other G7 partners, of course, but Japan as the presidency is willing to lead the discussion on such issues as global economy, regional affairs, including Ukraine and the Indo-Pacific, as well as global issues such as nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation, economic security, climate change, health, 
and development. We believe that the theme of next year's G7, addressing crisis, reigniting sustainable development, is decided with a similar awareness of the issues involved. The four themes set forth in the task force agenda are also timely. We would like to ask for your cooperation in making the G7 discussions broader, deeper, and more open by taking advantage of the characteristics of the T7 forum, which brings together the world's leading think tanks, including those from the global south. One of the strengths of discussions by think tanks is their analysis on current events from medium to long-term and historical perspectives and prescriptions for their future impact. The international community is witnessing the end of the post-Cold War era, but what comes next is still musky. We look forward to the recommendations on the next expected era and the path to reach there, including the challenges we must tackle. In addition to a bird's eye view, we also look forward to the expertise of think tanks in various fields. Today, expertise is indispensable in various aspects of foreign policy, including science and digitalization, which are in the agenda items of the task force. Our government is also incorporating the views and opinions of experts into its policies on a daily basis. And we believe that the T7 will add useful inputs in this regard. Finally, I have high expectations for the T7's ability to communicate with the public. In the midst of the current national and international divisions, and concerns surrounding information issues, including the dissemination of disinformation, it is more important than ever for think tanks to transmit reliable information so that the citizens of the G7 countries and broader citizens can gain an accurate understanding of current issues and facts and intentions of G7 initiatives are correctly understood by all the people around the world. We hope that today's inception conference will be a useful kickoff to next year. Uh, thank you very much for giving this occasion. Ambassador Nakamura, thank you so much for your remarks and that you are spending time with us tonight. Now, uh, before Ambassador Nakamura leaves, I'd like to ask for group photo. For those who can open camera, if you could please open your camera, uh, we appreciate. Okay, and then we just hold on. Thank you so much. And then are you there? Yes, okay, yes. So, because we have uh, quite a lot of participants here. So it will go, I'll go for uh, maybe three times call or something like this. So first, with a count of three, so three, two, one. And then I move on to the next screen. So three, two, one. And then we have one more <laughs> panel, so. We need to move on. Okay, so three, two, one. Okay, thank you so much for your uh, participation for group for the provider, the fun part. And then now uh, for those, um, except you are speaking, if you could please close your camera once again, that will be very much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, so now um, in this two hour event, we hope to share you the roadmap for T7. 
a G7 think tank engagement. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading somewhere else. <laughs> so uh, thank you and kindly close your camera. So now we are moving to the next session that will highlight the T7 linkage with a Think20 or T20 that will run under G20 India's 2023 presidency. Dean Sonobe will discuss how to optimize this dynamics between these two T initiatives with the guests we are delighted to welcome today from T20 India's core group. Dr. Samuel Saran is a president of the Observer Research Foundation, ORF, which is India's premier think tank headquartered in New Delhi. Professor Sachin Chaturvedi is Director General at the Research and Information System for Developing Countries, RIS, a New Delhi-based think tank, among so many other titles and posts he holds. Dean Sonobe, are you ready to take the floor from me, please? Okay, thank you, Kaori. Can you hear me? Yes. So, Samir and uh, Sachi, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, middle of the very busy schedule. So I heard that uh, Samir had to leave this discussion a little early. And then Sachi had just uh, come in or had come uh, yeah, from the, another meeting. So maybe let's start from the uh, Samir. So at the E20 India inception meeting, uh, not the inception, but the handover meeting, which took place a little earlier. Uh, you didn't really mention the T7, T20 collaboration, but uh, I hope that you, you heard uh, what I said in my the opening remarks, and then I emphasize the importance of T7, T20, even though I don't know whether it will really work or not for the, you know, better bridging uh, G7, G20, but uh, I think uh, it's worth trying. So I'd like to uh, know your, you know, opinion. Uh, maybe you are such an you know, insightful person, so I would very much like to uh, listen to you. Uh, Please, uh, thank you. For, uh, thank you. I hope I'm audible, and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. And I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm in Bombay, and I have to be flying out to another city, and that's why I had to. Uh, I was finding this time in a hotel room where I could join the call. And of course, Sachin is uh, uh, always busy. It doesn't matter whether you have T20 or T7, Sachin is uh, uh, one of our most sought after scholars. So apologies from India, but let me quickly make a few points. I, I heard uh, uh, the, the speaker from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs speak earlier. And um, uh, I can say that much of what he said resonates with what we have been uh, talking about as we plan the year ahead, uh, whether it is digitalization, whether it is putting together a collective uh, group of um, countries who can work together on some of the key challenges that confront us, climate change, development goals, economic stimulus, restarting our economy. Uh, and of course, uh, the political and polarized uh, public spheres, political systems uh, that we have to contend with. I think everything that I heard has in some ways or another been discussed in India as we were planning our own presidency. So I think it doesn't matter which group you're sitting in, the challenges we face are common. And therefore, the first reason why we have to collaborate and work together is because it is a common future that we, work, that we walk towards. And uh, it, it, all different pressure points would be required if we have to achieve success uh, at an uh, advanced uh, date. Uh, and of course, at, uh, uh, in a manner that is inclusive and uh, implicates many more than just uh, either the seven or the 20 countries that are sitting in the room. So, so inclusive action, collective action, and common future has to be um, uh, the, the mantra. And of course, uh, our, uh, our prime minister has uh, invoked this spirit uh, with, his, uh, 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 with his phrase around one earth and, and uh, you know, 
the vasudeva kutumbakum the the we are all one family one future one earth and and, and one journey and therefore i think uh, uh, the collaboration becomes uh, uh, absolutely an imperative for all of us let me um, also uh, just uh, add that uh, as the uh, as the uh, as the secretariat of the G, uh, t20 as we are looking ahead uh, we are seeing a few uh, important um, uh, touch points where we believe our work will uh, in many ways uh, coincide and we will need to work together more closely uh, in fact you will be happy to know that uh, as we plan the inception group meeting in january 13th and 14th in delhi uh, and you would have received invitations most of you would have got a communication those who have those who haven't please reach out to me and i'll make sure you have you, you will get one uh, we want all of your communities to participate so um, we will send it to you sir and you can send it to the entire t7 community those who are able to come to come we will we want to hear all of you but uh, on that particular inception group uh, one of our first side events is going to be a g7 g20 climate alliance conversation that how do you bring together the the conversations happening at the g7 that started in germany are going to be taken forward by japan how do we take that conversation and place it within the g20 framework how do we bring it into the sherpa conversation at the g20 itself so one of the side events we are hosting at the inception group meeting that means the first side event we are hosting under t7 is going to be with the g7 and and we are working closely with nick stern and our german colleagues who had written the report for g7 and of course we are uh, going to be meeting you later uh, this month in delhi and we want this event to be the beginning of multiple such conversations that we have whether it is digitalization which again is going to be a big theme of india's uh, presidency and japan has been a big partner in that uh, in fact tomorrow we have a very important japanese speaker speaking at the data for development uh, event that we are hosting orf is hosting with the g20 uh, with amitabh kant and his team uh, uh, we will have voices from other g7 countries who are coming in as well so whether it is digitalization whether it is climate action whether it is uh, uh, sorry that's the uh, that's the disadvantage of being in a hotel room uh, people call uh, but i just picked up the phone okay so whether it is uh, the digitalization agenda whether it is climate action whether it is uh, international development partnerships and rethinking the whole framework for sdgs whether it is rethinking sustainable consumption and lifestyle as the prime minister of india has been stressing on uh, i think these are all global agenda items they are not limited to the g20 and we are going to uh, work with adb institute and we are going to be having that meeting in december and we want to put together a series of four or five convenings through the next eight to nine months where we uh, work very closely with adbi and the think seven community so that the g20 does not only bring in the best minds that uh, uh, you have gathered here but also works for the best of all humanity the countries that we are wanting to bring into the discussions in africa and asia and other parts of the world so how can all of us work together for a much larger constituency is going to be the g20 uh, objective and of course sachin will give you um, many more details i don't want to um, stress too much but uh, we look forward to hosting you in india uh we are planning um, let me just leave a proposal with you since i have your attention uh, uh on march uh, 5th one day after icina dialogue we are holding back 200 scholars from uh, nearly 70 countries in delhi for a, a global research forum which will focus on g20 let me invite adb institute to partner with us on that day and also discuss the g7 the t7 agenda with this research community so uh, instead of just making it a g20 research community can we make it a g20 and g7 research community come and join us in delhi on march 5th we'll be happy to host you and plan something uh, substantial around your agenda as well with the much larger global community that we are gathering in delhi uh, great sami thank you very much for oh, very nice uh, or what i heard from you Uh, sound really great, uh, really nice, and uh, uh, you know the T7 Japan uh, process will have a kind of climax at, toward the end of April. We will have T7 summit in Tokyo mm -hmm. a few weeks before the uh, G7 summit in Hiroshima. But between 
this T7 summit and the G7 summit, we would like to hold a big event together with T20 India. For example, the ADB's annual conference, which will mm -hmm. be annual meeting, sorry, annual meeting, which will be held in Incheon, Korea, in the first week of May, and uh, also a global solutions uh, summit. Uh, we will borrow one session and then uh, let's have uh, one event together. Uh, and people, inviting, people uh, you know, uh, inviting the high profile policy makers uh, in G, uh, T7, uh, G7, G20, and also international organizations. And uh, I'm coming to New Delhi that by the end of this month and also uh, to attend uh, the uh, middle January, 13th to 14th uh, in mm -hmm. January for your T20 inception meeting. Thank you. So looking forward to meeting you finally in person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now uh, let's ask uh, Professor Sachin. Mm. Yes, and um, Professor Sachin is uh, still at his previous engagement. However, we have his colleague, Dr. Sabia. So maybe until, so he's holding a, a fault for Professor Sachin, maybe Dean, would you maybe like to a little bit discuss a little bit about the timeline or overlapping um, focus between two fora mm -hmm. with uh, Dr. Samuel here? Okay. So, Samuel, so thank you very much for staying with us. And then uh, so before the Sachin can join us, so the, let's talk about the kind of configuration of the task forces. Mm -hmm. So the previously, like at T20 Indonesia and then T20 Italy, and then uh, Saudi Arabia. So the, kind of there was a, uh, we saw kind of proliferation task forces. And then, <laughs> proliferation of policy briefs. So T20 Indonesia produced 130 policy briefs. Mm -hmm. So then T7 Japan uh, saying that only 16. <laughs> and then, <laughs> uh, uh, and then uh, uh, I, I found that uh, T20 India has a fewer number of uh, task forces. So, you know, we are in the same direction. Yes, yes. You know, we are. Uh, we had uh, decided, in fact, uh, between the core group, six of us, and the secretariat, uh, uh, ORF, we had uh, long conversations. And we uh, decided that we want to uh, have uh, focused uh, task forces. Uh, uh, maybe they will have more work streams, but they should have interdiscipl interdisciplinary conversations. So we have tried to narrow the number of task forces uh, and we have reduced them to seven. We are also launching a research initiative, a global research initiative uh, uh, as the eighth offering from India. And we are going to be unveiling details about that at the inception meeting on the eighth pillar. But seven task forces, uh, bigger in numbers because we want to bring in people who are working on employment and livelihoods and make them sit next to people who are working on macroeconomics and trade. So we want them to think together on how they implicate each other's lives. And we want uh, uh, better international policy coherence uh, uh, because uh, it implicates people on the streets. So we want to bring some of the macro and the micro together, for example. That's one of the task forces, which is a big task force. Similarly, multilateralism uh, is, a, is a big task force also because it looks at trade and looks at Bretton Woods and looks at uh, the UN and UN Security Council. But these conversations, we believe, should not happen uh, in isolation. They need to be happening together within the same task forces. Of course, we will have specific discrete recommendations for each of them. Uh, but uh, uh, taking uh, a cue from uh, you um, and ADB, we decided that we need to reduce. You know, luckily for India, uh, we are so many people in numbers, we don't have to increase numbers. We have to actually show we have to decrease numbers. You know, uh, for us, numbers is not exciting. We are, we are a very big um, uh, geography in all sorts okay. of ways. So numbers don't impress us. I think uh, the focus and the intensity of what we produce is going to be our driver. 
not the number of reports or the number of task forces or the number of co-chairs. Uh, uh, that is uh, not necessarily our motivation. That's one part of it. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, more importantly, uh, we uh, also believe that on the policy briefs, uh, 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 while we want to give people a chance to contribute, and we are creating a new commentary section on the T20 website. So those who want to give opinions and who want to ideate can contribute through the opinion section. We want to bring more people to participate. I think policy briefs need to, again, be very specific and focused. So uh, uh, we are not necessarily going to be chasing a new world record of policy briefs. That is not our target at all. Um, in fact, uh, uh, if they could be uh, lesser in number, but uh, more, uh, uh, contributory in, in many ways through the G20 process, I think that would be the measure of effectiveness. Mm -hmm. How much of our output is picked up by the leaders in their recommendations is something that should be the measure, not necessarily the, the amount of trees you have cut or the digital bytes you have produced. So um, we, are, we are not necessarily chasing numbers at all. Uh, I hope that in a, some sense gives you uh, an idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I, I, I fully agree with you. And the participation is very important. And uh, also the quality of policy proposal. So we, we try to find the uh, you know, best uh, kind of balance between the two uh, purposes. And uh, in the case of uh, T7, uh, we already started the calls, call for policy brief abstract. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, you will start very soon. Yes, right. no, we have started also. We have already received uh, 20 proposals. Mm -hmm. uh, I, we have also received 20 proposals already in the first wow. week or, or seven days of, its, uh, uh, of the call. So I'm worried. I'm worried <laughs> that uh, the excitement to write policy briefs is quite high around the world. <laughs> so, so, so how will we balance it? But uh, uh, what we also want to do, and maybe this is something we can all brainstorm since we have so many people here, is to co-produce outside of the policy briefs. Can ADBI and um, uh, the T7 and T20 co-publish certain uh, uh, recommendations and special reports on certain issues? Uh, and I think that is also something we can think about uh, in the next few weeks yeah. so that perhaps we could have a joint publication at the end of it, mm -hmm. where we mm -hmm. could come up with our common future report, where mm -hmm. We, we pick up four or five sectors and have a joint recommendation to both leaders. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good idea. And uh, yeah, so uh, maybe the policy briefs will be published in the website, but uh, not mm -hmm. only that, we will invite uh, all stars to the big event and then let them uh, talk to policy makers in the uh, big events okay. and let together also T7 uh, policy and the T20 policy brief. They will have a panel discussion and uh, uh, other interactions. So, so, uh, so that in, will be uh, very interesting. In, in this regard, uh, mm -hmm. I think the March 5th date, which uh, uh, I will uh, send to you and you could uh, distribute to your network. Uh, I think March 5th, that whole idea of having a global town hall in Delhi, where we have 200 confirmations from 65, 70 odd countries already. And if T7 can also come there, we can actually have a conversation with policymakers. So uh, that whole town hall, uh, you know, the foreign minister has confirmed he'll be at that town hall, the, our finance minister, Sherpa. We have confirmations from many of the G20 leadership. Uh, we will also have some ministers who will stay back for that town hall from other G20 countries. And if uh, uh, ADB and T7 networks can participate, I think that could be another way of uh, a much wider audience speaking to the big issues that we are trying to grapple with, we can hear voices from different parts of the world and what they think about the digital agenda or the climate agenda or the SDG agenda. I think uh, we have to open our doors and we have to hear voices. And that is yeah. what that big town hall that we are trying to institute uh, seeks mm. to do. Mm. So great. So you are like a fountain of uh, good ideas. Thank you very much. So that's why I really love to listen to you. Uh, so I think it's about time. So unfortunately, Sachin could not participate, but uh, maybe we will have uh, other opportunities. Or well, we try to somehow take time. Yeah, yeah, later. Data. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Okay, good idea. So thank I you very much, just, Samir. I have mm? just left my email on the on the uh, chat window, and those mm -hmm. who want to write to me can write to me directly. I have also left the date, <laughs> but there were some questions. 
Um, mm -hmm. and I will respond to each of you, I promise you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank so you. we are uh, moving to the next session. So the next session will be a kind of introduction of uh, T7 task forces and uh, also some discussion and uh, possibly the Q&A. Uh, so uh, let me introduce a uh, moderator, uh, Mr. Nicola Bushu. Uh, oh, wait, uh, ah, my draft. <laughs> I know. <laughs> OK, so uh, the, Mr. Nicola Bushu has uh, co-chaired. Uh, my microphone is working already. Good. It's working. It's maybe, maybe, please mute. Yeah, and then uh, he has uh, co chaired infrastructure related task forces of the T20, uh, Think 20 processes in the last several years, and led numerous policy brief making teams and held global seminars, particularly with Indonesia's Ministry of Finance. He is a fellow at the Global Solutions Initiative in Berlin, the co founder and the president of Circle Grand Paris, a Paris-based think tank specializing in sustainable finance, and a co-editor of a global project called Intersecting, which is a very interesting project, and also an advisor to ADBI team, uh, that is uh, myself. So, Nicola, after all is yours, please start the uh, discussion of the task force co -chairs. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Sonobe. Good, uh, good evening and good morning, uh, everyone. Um, so the next, in the next, uh, in the next few minutes, uh, we will try to have a first uh, series of insights uh, in the different task forces of this uh, T7 Japan. Let me uh, briefly uh, remind us and everyone what those four task forces are about. Uh, the first task force, uh, or task force one about development and economic prosperity. The task force two, all task forces are equally important, of course. Uh, it's about well-being, environmental sustainability, and just transition. Uh, the third task force is about science and digitalization for a better future. And the fourth task force uh, is about peace, security, and global governance. Um, about this fourth task force, it's uh, um, something that was not so much there uh, in the past years in the T20 um, and uh, also in the T7 is very new, but uh, the connectivity between development issues, macroeconomic issues and peace, security and global governance uh, um, appeared um, very critical and we wanted to uh, deepen this aspect and this was also reminded uh, in the uh, opening statement by uh, G7. G20 Sushapa uh, of, uh, of Japan. Uh, so these are the four task forces. Um, and to uh, uh, address uh, the issues of today, we wanted to ask the co-chairs uh, not to address specifically their task force, but to join us um, in uh, sharing a few thoughts about addressing crises, reigniting sustainable development, and bridging the G7 and the G20. Uh, Nicola, uh, so yes. could, could you uh, speak a little more loudly? So sure, yeah, ab it's a bit difficult for us to hear. So is it better like this? Yes, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Apologies. So the, the four task forces, uh, we wanted to organize the discussion around the four task forces, but it's but more to focus on cross-cutting issues and cross-cutting approaches uh, between the different dimensions that will be uh, explored by the uh, task forces. For this uh, reason, uh, what we propose to you, and please uh, use the uh, uh, Q&A box during the, the discussion if you have uh, um, any uh, uh, question or any observation, we'll try to also address those. Um, so uh, <coughs> I would first like to invite uh, Abla Abdelatif, the Executive Director and Director of Research at the Egyptian Center of Economic Studies, 
along with um, Akio Takemoto, the program lead of the Institute for Advanced Studies at the United Nations University in Tokyo, Anna Katharina Hornig, the director of IDOS in Germany, and Jenny Gordon, a non-resident mm -hmm. fellow of Lowy Institute and honorary professor at the Center for Social Research and Method at Australia National University, respectively from Task Force 1, 2, 3, and 4, uh, for a first segment of discussion for about uh, uh, 12 to 15 minutes about the topic addressing crisis, which of course a broad, uh, a broad topic. Uh, but of course, in that context, there are issues of science and technologies. There are issues of uh, what the G7 can do to meet challenges such as the 1.3, the 1.5 degree target. Um, there is the issue of multilateralism. There is the issue of peace, not just peace making, but investing in peace and what would that mean? Who would like to uh, start uh, for this first uh, round of exchanges? Maybe uh, Abla first, first uh, with the task force I one? Start, yeah, I, I, I can start because I also have a shaky connection. So I prefer to start, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, um, uh, uh, hello everyone. And I'm very glad to be here. I'm very glad to be working with ADBI. And um, uh, I have this overlap of being uh, from Africa and uh, from the Middle East, being from Egypt, and having worked before in G uh, in T20 Saudi and T20 uh, Italy. I'm very glad to be in, in in T7 as well. When we talk about addressing crisis, irrespective of what type of crisis we're talking about, whether we're talking about food, whether we're talking about energy, talking about climate, irrespective, we always find that the the global South seems to be you know, bearing a, a bigger share of the effect of the, of the crisis, even though more often than not, they are not the reason behind it. Like in the case of the climate, we always, always say this Africa completely three percent to the climate issues, and yet it is, it is suffering all the, all the negative uh, effects. So the, globe, the global south as a whole is actually suffering a lot more than the, than the developed world. And I think this is an important uh, starting point, and it means that the global south needs a lot of support from the developed uh, countries to help them uh, manage the crisis. This is number one. Number two, uh, I think it's very important that we go to the core of the problems and the core of the crisis. And part of it is that the global south has a very small vote in everything that's happening in the world. And, and, and this needs to change and is important. Uh, um, and I think, uh, uh, T7 and T20 are good um, starting points for this to have more, a bigger role uh, and a bigger voice for the global, for the global South. Uh, uh, having said this, uh, at the level of the countries themselves, there's an issue about crisis. When you face a crisis, you can either manage it properly or mismanage it. Managing it properly means not only dealing with the symptoms of the crisis, like, you know, rushing to try and uh, solve the, the problem of health, solve the uh, uh, the problem of, of uh, uh, poverty, etc. But actually, it's important that we go to the core of the problems. And I think this is extremely important because when we, during the time of COVID, for instance, in Egypt, we have done a lot of studies on different sectors and we realized that many of the problems that are felt in the country, in those sectors, were actually problems that existed before the crisis. All what the crisis did is simply amplify okay, the, neg the, the weakness of that part of the structure. So not addressing the core and looking only at the symptoms means that the countries are not benefiting from the crisis. Each crisis has a silver lining of its own that needs to be built on and be used in order to improve the situation of the, of, uh, of the, of the country itself, sort of growing out of the crisis, okay? Not making life more difficult for its people. And I think the same level, and this is my last point, the same level applies also globally. When you look globally at the, at the present situation, at the Russia-Ukraine war, at conflicts you know, of problems between countries should not be resolved with wars. They need to have peace, okay? And they need to have negotiations. And again, going back to the core of problems and why did the conflict start in order to solve them? Not doing it this way gets us into trouble and wars like the one that we are watching now and observing, and that can get a lot worse because because the, the, the rules of the game between the 
all the countries, the wisdom is sort of lost and, and, and things are just taking off on their own. So again, it's the mismanagement of the crisis. It all needs to be done with a lot of transparency, a lot of sharing of correct information and a lot of collaboration and belief that this one life for all of us, okay, it's one future for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Abla. I, I will ask um, um, Anna Katarina. You were last year uh, also the co-chair, uh, the lead co-chair of the um, of the T7. Would you say, would you say also that the uh, the pandemic uh, crisis has also kind of affected uh, the way uh, international relations are being shaped, and uh, that has weakened a number of uh, factors of uh, policy making, both both. Uh, 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 nationally or regionally or globally? Uh, thank you, uh, Nicolas, for bringing us together. Thank you, Dean uh, Sonobo, for, for inviting and, and kick-starting the next year of the Think7 and taking, taking this responsibility over. Um, it is a real honor to be able to contribute again and, and join the discussions. Um, now, to, to answer your questions, question, Nicola, um, and also to build on what Abla just mentioned, I mean, what we observed during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was that um, if you looked at how much um, the different countries and different income groups could, um, in a way, use the crisis also for, um, for yeah, Building forward or investing, basically as a modernization program for the for the um, economies, and we um, trust the numbers of the I, IMF. Then we could see basically um, a ten times difference. No? So high income economies could um, mobilize around ten times the amount than. Uh, low income economies for investing, for stabilizing their economies, and then also using the crisis to move forward and, and modernize their economies. Um, that would, uh, would confirm what Abla is saying, that basically the crisis posed a moment that some could use also in terms of um, beneficially investing into their economies while others um, uh, could, could simply not. And that of course then widens, widens uh, the gap substantially. Um, having said that, I would nevertheless also out of the European context say that the crisis was also in the external policy making fields used as an opportunity to, um, to mobilize for investments into um, into social security, uh, into the sector of social security, into the sector of health, and in the sector of education and and research, um, and also foster dialogues on the international level, including the G7 and the G20, uh, that contribute to to an understanding of the importance of investing into these three areas that are crucial, crucial because they are structurally deter determining the, um, the resilience of societies and the ability of societies to invest and adapt and live with ongoing change processes. So a um, bit of both, no, basically, but definitely um, also here, um, the, the emphasis I want to make is also that the crisis was also used in order to, to um, move policy making forward in the fields of social security, health and education and research. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Katarina, Anna Katarina. And I think we might get back to this um, in, the, in the next minutes, but also uh, with, the other, uh, with the other co chairs. Um, Jenny Gordon or uh, uh, Akio uh, Takemoto, who would like to pick up on the very strong uh, arguments that were uh, 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 laid down and put on, on the table? Maybe uh, first and foremost, Jenny, as uh, you are from uh, Australia, and, it's, uh, um, and uh, you are also in a member of the Advisory Council of ADBI, but you have also a very long standing experience of working not only with think tanks, but also with government, right, in, uh, in Australia. At this moment, how do you see um, the, uh, the post, but it's not, pandemic is not over, but the post pandemic landscape as an opportunity to uh, uh, con have lines converging or uh, with risks of uh, further divergence between uh, so called developed and uh, developing or emerging or lower income countries? 
Uh, th thank you very much. And I'd just also like to um, acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people on whose country I'm, my farm is just outside of Canberra. Um, so that the, the question is really, do we think the pandemic has been a catalyst for good or whether we're actually going to go in the other direction? And I'd love to think it's a catalyst for good, but I actually think that um, we're looking, facing a, a recession potentially in 2023, uh, particularly in the developed countries, we're facing, um, you know, some really unsustainable debt burden in a number of low income developing countries. And we don't, even with the pandemic, we didn't manage to coordinate nearly as well as we should. Um, and we still haven't really got our act together. So thinking about the the sort of the, the, the theme Four, which is um, peace, stability and governance. I was sort of trying to understand and think about what's going wrong. Why are we so bad at actually getting things together? Because most crises are actually avoidable if we act early enough, but we don't act. And most of them have solutions. We know what those solutions are, um, but we rarely put the solutions in place at the scale that is necessary. Um, and so many of the risks that require collective action are the ones that we're not good at addressing. And climate change is clearly one of the main ones there. And it's a preeminent risk because it underpins a whole bunch of other things, including potential for future pandemics. And so really one of, trying to understand why this is the case, why are we so bad at you know, coming together to resolve these problems and what is, whether it's getting worse or whether it's getting better. And I have a feeling it's getting worse and we really need some circuit breakers on the getting worse. And so trying to understand this made me think about how we actually, what's, what's going on with increasing uncertainty, how increasing uncertainty means that people search for a sort of an ideology, something to believe in that gives them better certainty. And that just makes it harder to cooperate on policy solutions. And so I think that the G7 is, is really uniquely placed to actually do something about um, some of these uncertainties and actually work on things like prevention and early intervention to release pressure before it turns into conflict. So identifying where there are pressures that can lead to conflict and being able to put in place triggers to do something about those. Um, you know, we know food security, we know growing inequality on access to resources, we know they're triggers to conflict. So we ought to be able to do something about it. We need an early warning system to be able to say, when should we move? There are a bunch of essential service risks. Um, the financial system, the payment system, you know, that's the, um, the issues around cyber security. They're essential services risks that actually threaten a whole bunch of economic activity and the ability of countries to, to trade. So we've got to do something on really working on prevention as well as mitigation adaptation and reducing the scale and the impact of crises. And so by, that's by building preparedness and resilience. So we need collective action for many of these solutions to actually happen. So um, one of my roles, previous roles, was um, chief economist and I looked after the development program at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And a lot of the development aid tends to focus on micro solutions and they're really good solutions. And economists are getting really good at, you know, running trials and tests to see which ones are effective and building the evidence base for what works. But what we're not good at is then having the scale to build those up so that they make a real difference. Um, so we need the cooperation for scaling the solutions to work. We need cooperation to resolve conflict of resources, we need to be able to put in place sharing arrangements that people regard as everybody has to make a compromise, but they're considered fair and not, you know, unduly against, particularly the global south that starts from a lower bargaining position. And then we need to agree rules on trade as well. So I think in terms of what we've got to work on is we've got to work on what, you know, um, Bob Putnam called bridging capital, social capital sort of thing, which is not the in-group capital, the bonding capital, but the capital between groups. And so G7 is a bunch of countries that have largely sort of democracy, similar kinds of values. G20 is a, is a broader grouping where not always the value is going to be different. And so G7 has the ability to sort of 
make the steps to build the bridging capital and not just the bonding capital. And so we've got to move away from just rhetoric around saying, well, we want like work with like-minded, we want to work with people who have common values with us and the like. What we really need to do is actually move away from strengthening the bonding capital to building bridging capital to actually cooperate. Thank you. Thank you, excellent. We will continue with uh, this uh, uh, bonding capital and uh, bridging capital notion that that that's very very interesting. A question uh, for all of us, um, all of you, uh, but also especially now for uh, Akio Takemoto with the uh, Institute for Advanced Studies at uh, United Nations University, and also uh, uh, mm -hmm. representing the co-chair of Task Force Two. Mm -hmm. How can uh, research organizations within the academia or think tanks uh, can contribute to this uh, to this bridging? And uh, yeah. maybe from your experience, from the point of view of, of being in Japan, how do you read uh, this uh, state of the of, of the world affairs yes. and production crisis? Yeah, thank you very much, Nicolas, for inviting me to speak on uh, this important occasion. Yes, um, UNU, United Nations University is one of the of course, policy think tank of this group, but I uh, acknowledge that we are very good uniqueness, two uniqueness. One is we are UN as an agency, so we can directly address to the global issue um, implemented by UN organization as well. So one more uniqueness is we have a, not only a think tank function, but also we have an educational function, higher educational function, master course, um, PhD courses. So, so we can you know, directly um, you know, inform um, the critically important uh, agenda, global agenda to the students and to capacity build them uh, to uh, develop the future leaders uh, to lead the climate action and sustainable development across the world. Okay, so let me cover you know, um, my uh, impression. So uh, I fully agree with uh, uh, overarching themes of T7, addressing crisis, uh, de-igniting sustainable development. But these two elements should be aligned or should be um, synergized with, with, with each other. So what happens in the world is, you know, there are huge amount of you know, investment in the deployment and uh, uh, dissemination of clean energy infrastructure. So according to the IEA assessment, uh, that requires, in order to achieve the carbon neutrality um, by 2050, we, uh, the world needs uh, annually, annual four trillion US dollars for clean energy investment. So we need to consider not only the positive impact on greenhouse gas emission reduction through such massive investment. But we also consider the, you know, some negative or you know, some trade-off elements through the implement, uh, implementation of such big infrastructure, in particular, uh, affect, affecting uh, issue affects uh, vulnerable sectors. Let me uh, point out one example, um, both happening both in developed and developing countries. Um, you know, due to the crisis uh, of climate as well as energy crisis, and also uh, such an you know very fast um, deployment of uh, renewable energy, that causes um, the you know issues uh, for uh, poor people. Um, and in, in order to you know in order to achieve the carbon neutrality, that should be that means you not. Know, that we realize through no one leaving behind. So all people, even including poor people, poor sectors, or small and medium industries, or remote island residents, can access to not fossil fuel, but clean energy. So in my in our assessment of ENIS, um, that wouldn't that such an you know, inclusive um, clean energy deployment not happens even among developed countries. So we need some um, corrective action uh, mm. to achieve it. The other um, example is that in order to achieve the carbon neutrality, uh, we should make much efforts through the non-energy solution, nature-based solution. So that is linked to the, you know, 
synergy of trade-offs between climate action and biodiversity conservation. So what happens in Japan and other countries is the you know, issues or trade-off between um, you know, development of um, solar power infrastructure and land develop sustainable land de development, uh, you know, farmlands or uh, in, uh, you know deterioration of residential areas. Uh, that are caused, um, there are a lot of uh, causes, but uh, one of the issues is the lack of appropriate policy framework to you know, um, properly implement um, deployment of such uh, huge uh, energy structure. Mm. And also, you know, um, renewable energy requires you know, massive rare metals that is causes, uh, you know, unsustainable development of mining industry. So as such, there are a lot of issues uh, on this trade-off uh, happening uh, between climate change and biodiversity uh, conservation. So from this point, I think G7 community, G uh, T7 uh, have a very important role to collect the data and information on such issues and gaps and needs uh, to and uh, to resolve the issues to achieve uh, our goal then transform uh, our knowledge to g7 thank you very much thank you thank you very much and uh, you are nearly also uh, making the connection with the our next uh, uh, segment of uh, of exchange about uh, reigniting sustainable development uh, but just before we go we, we go to the to the next uh, segment i wish to also acknowledge the participation with us uh, of uh, professor bang bang Negoro, who was the lead co-chair of uh, t20 uh, indonesia and uh, takahara sensei with uh, jaika mm -hmm. and uh, so thank you thank you very much if you have trouble with the uh, with the voice please use the q the q and a always during our discussion to share any uh, any observation thought of uh, or, or question abla uh, please a few comments we have in initiated our discussion thank you very much I, I actually wanted to address the question that you raised directly whether think tanks and academia can actually do anything about bridging this gap i think that the think tanks are the ones that are best equipped to do it because governments are busy with the crisis itself, okay? The, so they have their, their, their problems and their issues on daily basis, but the think tanks can think deeply. And that's the whole idea. We can think deeply and we can think out of the box. box. And, and I think what we need to do uh, a lot in our think tanks is, is think of the mechanisms for this bridging to take place, the institutional format, because it's a matter of different, different cultures, different beliefs, different settings. So what are the institutional channels that would allow this talk to take place? And I think the collaboration that I'm, I'm watching now between T7 and, and T20 is the beginning of that. And in our policy papers, as limited as they are, because it's, not, it's about quality, not about quantity, I think those, those channels are going to be addressed properly. Just wanted to say that, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I think it's a very important uh, point and it also resonates with uh, some questions that were uh, shared in the chat because uh, um, there is energy in the context of the G7, T7, G20, T20. Um, and it was also very clear in the opening uh, uh, discussion with Dean Sonobe and uh, Samia Saran uh, that uh, there is an, not just an opportunity, but a deep need so that the energy from coming from all sides is being channeled into uh, new findings, new ways to think about policy making across G7, G20. Maybe one last word on, on this, and we, uh, if you allow me, uh, move on to the next segment of our discussion. Maybe Anna Katarina, last word. You had a meeting recently with the, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, G7 Sherpa of, of Germany, and the, the, during the, uh, the, the, the T7 time, there were a lot of exchanges also. Um, do you think that has benefited both the outputs of the T7, but also the uh, some aspects of the G7 German presidency? Thank you, Nicola. I think uh, the close interaction with um, the, the group of Sherpa from all G7 countries has been very, very important and um, in many ways instrumental in 
um, in facilitating the science to policy dialogue. Um, the, in Germany, the presidency fell together with a new government coming in that also then uh, was challenged substantially immediately by the still ongoing COVID-19 crisis, but also um, uh, Russia's war um, of aggression in Ukraine and, and the respective effects from there. So many elements came together that also created quite um, a substantial interest on the level of the German government to, to engage and, and receive um, advice, but also um, simply yeah, in the dialogue with the Think7 uh, process, um, sharpen their own thinking. No, to put it maybe that way, yeah. um, and uh, I just want to want to underline that this was um, a little bit special for for due to this situation in Germany that it was a new government, and at the same time I think the interaction with all Sherpa from all seven countries was was crucial, um, and then could also of course be facilitated further. By the by, the dialogue processes within the G20 and T20 process. No? So, um, to me, it was the 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 ongoing year was actually a very good example of uh, the role of uh, scientific and think tank networks um, in supporting um, in supporting global governance. No? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And one last uh, aspect I would like to. Uh, uh, take from this uh, uh, first segment of our conversation is this question of linkages, but also as uh, uh, um, Akio San, you pointed out, to trade-offs, even if it was more specifically trade-offs, climate and biodiversity, but there are the negotiations about the next uh, biodiversity global framework or convention that are taking place right now in Montreal, and uh, this is absolutely not secondary. Uh, also, this does not emerge as strongly as a number of other issues on 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 the global agendas. But uh, probably that will be absolutely critical uh, to 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 understand what are the outcomes and how also in the G7 context uh, there can be some push and negotiations on what whatever topics with within the wider uh, context of the G20. So there are there are some questions about trade there are some questions about food and food systems so let us go uh to the next uh, step of uh to this uh, this morning or this evening discussion uh thank you very much abla Abdelatif, uh, uh akio takemoto anna katarina hornich and jenny gordon please stay with us right because we will try to get back to you uh, in a few in a few minutes so about reigniting sustainable development, one reason we thought uh, we should put it as a main topic is because on the one hand, there are constantly innovations linked with uh, sustainability, climate change, and many other topics, but also on the other hand, uh, constant warnings about the fact that uh, global, uh, collectively, we uh, are at risk of not being able to achieve fully the uh, Agenda 2030, and there are other global goals that we feel we might not be able to achieve as, as um, easily. Um, so reigniting sustainable development is both addressing policy trajectories, but also uh, getting a bit deeper into how to activate uh, uh, solutions, how to activate strategies, policies uh, within the G7 and beyond. And for this, uh, thank you, Dil Rahut. You are the Vice Chair of Research and a Senior Research Fellow at ADBI and uh, Co-Chair of Task Force One. Uh, Dr. Katsuo Matsushita, Senior Fellow at uh, the Institute for Global Environmental Studies, IGES. You also played a very important role during the T20 Japan a few years ago, as I remember. Uh, welcome, Alisa Jade McDonald bertel uh, who is with a very important organization, which might be a little bit less well known by a number of uh, uh, friends and participants here, because she's a system board member at CGIAR. And uh, probably it will be useful to explain a little bit what CGIAR is about. But thank you very much for uh, joining in. And Antonio Villafranca, uh, who I 
could barely not introduce, but I will. He's director of research at ISPI, uh, was a driving force during the T20 Italy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Antonio, uh, for uh, joining in as well. So about reigniting sustainable development, there are different angles uh, linked with either the Agenda 2030, about the questions of transitioning, um, about incubating new visions of development. This is a strong point uh, on the, the uh, table of the G20 India, for instance, but also uh, cognizant of the war situation in Ukraine and other conflicts, but especially the war situation in Ukraine and the impacts on uh, very important segments of global markets, such as energy. Uh, can it have a positive uh, 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 impact at the end? on uh, uh, accelerating, for example, transition to uh, renewable energy. So these are the a couple of questions we wanted to briefly address. And um, who would like maybe to, to start with the opening remarks? Dr. Matsushita, yes, the floor is yours. Then maybe we'll go to uh, Antonio. I think you are on mute in this moment. So please unmute yourself or if anyone from the tech, yes, no, not yet. If anyone from the technical team, yes. Yeah, okay, yes. okay. Uh, thank you very much, Nicola, for your kind introduction. And um, taking this opportunity, I would like to thank Dean Songbe and ADBI colleagues for hosting T7 Japan. I look forward to working with you for the coming months. Uh, I am uh, interested in discussing what are possible T7 recommendations for how the 1.5 degree centigrade could be met, and what are possible T7 recommendations for how the implementation of SDGs could be accelerated. I am also interested in discussing what are the policy challenges for the Japanese G7 presidency in 2023 under the new geopolitical circumstances, particularly social and environmental challenges to achieving the SDGs and Paris Climate Change Agreement after COVID-19 and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Let me first talk about the implications of Russians, Russia's invasion of Ukraine on energy transition and climate change policy. Actually, I just has published, just published a paper on this issue today. The war in Ukraine has not only unleashed a humanitarian tragedy, but has also dealt with the effort to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions as a powerful supply side shock. It seems clear at this point, the war has complicated the transition path in the short term. In the longer term, however, the logic of energy security and economics could converge to kick net zero transition efforts into a higher gear. Bold moves would be needed at unprecedented speed to boost energy efficiency measures and adopt renewable energy alternatives to fossil fuels. If adopted, such actions could drive net zero technologies down their respective cost curves and build a pathway to faster decarbonization. The longer term impact could, could prove to be a positive turning point if leaders act with far-sightedness and courage, and if they are supported by a growing popular mandate in doing so. Next, challenges to the climate crisis. Since COP26, it has become the de facto standard for major countries to aim for net zero emissions of greenhouse gases in their national development strategies. For countries and corporations, decarbonization has become a precondition for economic survival and the global era of great competition for decarbonization has begun. But the time is running out. Building on the results of COP26 and 27, it is essential to ensure a managed and just transition to deliver the agreed transition to a net zero society to achieve the 1.5 degree target 
through an economic model based on low emission and climate resilient development, which includes the issue of finance, job creation, and just transition, loss and damage, energy transformation, innovation, carbon pricing, transportation reform, housing and urban planning, circular economy, including measures against marine plastics, among others. As for the acceleration of, of SDGs implementation, I would like to emphasize the importance of an integrated and co-benefit approach, which takes various synergies and trade-offs of the objectives and targets into account, as Akio Takemoto has uh, referred to. The final point that, that I would like to make is the challenges to integrate integrated regional sustainable transition. The reason why I emphasize the regional approach is that uh, current issues that the, the world is facing, like uh, pandemic and climate change and energy security issues, are caused by the sort of global group, the, the negative impacts of globalization. And in order to mitigate the negative impacts of globalization and to build a sustainable society, it is important uh, to make an approach from the regional or sustainable building. The, the, gov the government of Japan formulated the regional decarbonization roadmap in June 2021. This roadmap outlines the path and concrete measures for regional decarbonization that will also serve as a regional growth strategy. The goal is to create at least 100 regions that lead the way in decarbonization by 2030 and to implement priority measures such as mm. on-site solar power generation and energy efficient housing throughout the country. To promote local decarbonization or local green deal, cooperation among local governments in G7 and other countries, including sharing the best practices and technological cooperation is highly desirable. Include, yeah. include, yeah, include, yeah. Thank you very much. Dr. Masushi, th thank you so much. I can, mm. uh, hearing you, I can already imagine um, how a number of uh, uh, the, uh, the directions you're pointing out uh, could nurture uh, policy recommendations from uh, our uh, T7. Um, you were mentioning, for instance, the issue of just transitions and echoing also questions in the chat, but also overall discussions of why it is so important to have uh, a quality exchange. Uh, between G7, G, G, the wider G20, is because on the one hand, for example, uh, just energy transition partnerships were formulated uh, at the COP26 and uh, supported by G7. And then uh, uh, Indonesia has uh, sort of implemented its own version with the energy transition mechanism. And there are many discussions going on about then how South Africa could do that and other countries which are also on the list. And I think this is a discussion that includes uh, energy transformation pathways, technological uh, in, uh, in transformations and investments, but also wider spheres of uh, policy making ranging as far to food or natural based solutions. And uh, we need to deepen that discussion because in this moment, it remains a little bit uh, scattered around. Um, I was also thinking, listening to you, uh, the, Dr. Matsushita, that uh, <laughs> In this, in this context, we need probably to pay more attention about uh, transformation of food mm. systems because there is the return of hunger. Uh, and uh, when we had discussions to prepare for this uh, <laughs> seminar today, I was saying the 1.5 degrees uh, uh, is is already passed and uh, we are not on track for the agenda 2030 and advice to look more closely at solutions proposals. So before we go to deal route into uh, Alisa, I would like just to ask uh, uh, our colleague uh, Antonio uh, Villafranca also to reflect on such transformations and maybe also on your experience with the uh, T T20 um, and also at regional level, especially in the Mediterranean region, about those different uh, components. Antonio, the floor is yours. Please try to, to uh, uh, we have a bit of time ahead, so we are not th so constrained, but please try to, to keep your first insights as uh, a bit concise so that we have more time for, uh, for an exchange if possible. But Antonio, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Nicolas. Thank you, DBIE, for having me today. Well, there is so far a bottom line of what has been said also uh, by our colleagues, which is, you know, the, a different perception in the global south on uh, the effects uh, and responsibilities for both COVID and the Ukraine war. Uh, let's be frank, uh, when it comes to COVID, uh, the answer provided by the G7 countries was too small and too late. And when it comes to the Ukraine war, there are some impacts uh, which are felt as extremely unequal uh, for, uh, from the uh, global south. Uh, you mentioned food. Food is strictly related also to the effects of uh, sanctions, G7 sanctions basically to, uh, uh, to Russia. Uh, the president of the African Union has just uh, said very, very clearly that uh, you know, the problem, for instance, with insurers uh, are making much more difficult from, uh, for African countries to import fertilizers and grains. And also France and Germany just recognize it. So it's responsibilities of G7 countries to make this sanction you know, better, also to alleviate the burden on uh, the global south. When it comes specifically to uh, inflation, uh, which is, of course, in part uh, related to food and energy uh, prices. So we know that the Fed and the ECB raised the interest rates six times this year, uh, the, uh, the Fed three times, uh, the, uh, the ECB. Uh, the result is a reduced, of course, growth all over the world, including uh, Europe and including the global south, but with unequal uh, effects in terms of that sustainability. And again, what is the responsibility of the G7? Because we know that, for instance, the DSSI, uh, which is the Debt Services Pension Initiative, is already over, and the common framework for debt treatments uh, is basically not working. So again, what can the G7 do? Also acting as a platform uh, inside the G20 to reactivate, to enhance, this, uh, uh, this mechanism, which could again alleviate the burden on the uh, global south. And when it comes to uh, energy transition, I want to close it because I know there is a time constraint. Uh, let's be frank, COP27, Abla, our Egyptian friend, of course, uh, in, in Egypt, some good results were achieved. And you mentioned, some of you also mentioned the loss and damage fund, which is, you know, a new uh, achievement, a good one, but which is a beautiful frame without a picture inside. We don't know how much money will be put inside, who is going to pay for how long we are going to pay. And even if we take the commitment by, made by G7 countries uh, to give 100 billion euros uh, to the global south or developing countries for the energy transition, only a part of it has been given so far. So there is a lot to be done. And Last but not least, the decision already taken by the G7 to have a cap on uh, energy prices. So what, are, what are the effects of this potential cap, which should be introduced in one month or so uh, uh, to, uh, in the global south? I mean, there is a responsibility for G7 countries to consider the effects of their decisions on the global south and to work with the global south. And I think that this could be one of the, uh, let's say, final aim, final targets of our Think, uh, think 7 uh, this year. Thank you. Antonio, thank you very much and very strong points uh, as usual. But one question is, how would you point out to one or two key priorities uh, linking this description of the, uh, um, of the global governance landscape? Um, and uh, the need to, um, I would say, bring support to uh, the delivery of the Agenda 2030 or a number of uh, global commitments. Maybe, Nicolas, it's not strictly related to the uh, Agenda 2030, but, uh, it, you know, the first priority in my view is debt sustainability, which is money. Sorry to be so, uh, you know, direct. I mean, there is a serious risk of many countries in the global south uh, to default. Uh, this is the case in Latin America, Argentina, Ecuador, El Salvador. They are on the brink 
of default. This is the case in, uh, for Africa, Tunisia, Kenya, Nigeria, Zambia, which already defaulted, not to mention Asia. So first, what can we do to avoid the default? Because we, in, a, the, in a situation of default, of course, uh, you know, also SDGs objectives are very, extremely difficult to, uh, to, uh, to achieve. And the second thing, uh, which is a priority for me, is energy. Because there is a zero-sum uh, strategy followed by rich countries. Also inside the European Union, we have the money to buy, you know, Hydro, uh, hydrocarbons, we can do it, we can afford it, but what about, you know, uh, countries in the global south? I mean, we are keeping energy which could be useful, which could be used by, by them. So these two issues, I think, are, are, are crucial at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will pass it on to Dil and to Dil Rahut and to Alicia. And then afterwards, maybe uh, Dean Sodobe, if you would like to say a few words as lead co-chair of T7 Japan. And I see uh, no, uh, Professor Bang Bang is uh, on video with us uh, about uh, also the overall T20 perspective, because both of you have been also instrumental. And that was recalled by uh, Samia Saran about pushing for a quality dialogue at T7, T20. But before that, um, Dil Raut or Alisa Jade, who would like to, uh, to, uh, to, to step in first? Alisa, please. Well, go ahead. Thank you, Alisa. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the floor. Uh, if you, if you look at like, uh, you know, like I come from a very small countries, you know, nested in the Himalayas from Bhutan. And I want to speak from the perspective of very small developing countries in Asia. And also I have lived for several years in Africa as, a, as an employee of CGIA. So I'd like to, to bring the perspective of the small poor nations uh, around the globe. So if you look at, uh, as a humanity, I think we have made a very significant progress. We can see for, from our own life and, and during the COVID, uh, we, how we face the challenges and how we ma managed to come up. That shows a uh, great amount of progress. If you look at uh, the, the agriculture production system also compared to 1960s, we have almost tripled our productions and we have achieved uh, this increase in productions, uh, not through increase in land because we had limited land, but through, through very sustainable production system. So we have achieved this great, uh, uh, progress. However, like we have, it's it has not come for free. It has come with a cost. We have we have really like we can we can see the cost. We are already experiencing in the form of climate change, the environmental degradations, water stress, the quality of air. We have like you know the damage has has been very severe, and and we are facing the consequences. And if we don't do anything to 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 you know, I mean like uh, reverse this this uh, adverse impact that we have ca caused, you know, the, the future of our, our, our earth is going to be at stake. And also like, you know, what are we going to leave to our next generations, our, our children and, and grandchildren who are yet to come, their voices, which, which we never hear, we listen to. So that's why I think Global North uh, G7 has a very important role to play in making this world a uh, a sustainable, a better world, not only for us, but for our generation to come. And, and the other thing is that uh, when you talk about G7, the, we, we, we tend to misunderstand between the problem of the global south and global north. Today, the problem that we are facing is not of the global south or the global north. It's about the, about the entire humanity. It's a, it's a global goods. We have damaged the global goods that we have. And, and, uh, and, and it's very important that, uh, that G7 countries put together resources and ensure that uh, that the development uh, the process that we take forward is uh, green development and is very inclusive. We would like to see a, a development that is inclusive, you know, in the sense that no nations, no individual is left behind in the process of you know moving forward. So, so that's something that I would like to urge uh, G7 countries to to put into their agenda and and also like taking into account what my colleagues have said, uh, uh, like uh, Dr. Kazu and 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 uh, uh, Dr. Antino and others have said, and also Alva has really like everybody has clearly pointed out that that we need to be inclusive, we need to be green, we need to we need to ensure that we hand over a, a, a earth that is that is you know sustainable for generation and generation to come. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Thank you, thank you very much. And at this stage, let me also remind everyone who has joined uh, uh, this uh, T7 uh, uh, launch conference or inception conference 
that the call for abstracts for the policy briefs, right, uh, are opened. Um, go to the Think, Tef, Think 7 website and please uh, share any uh, proposals by January the 9th. Uh, so we have uh, 20 minutes ahead of us um, with a few more uh, issues we want to, to touch upon. Um, and uh, one last but not least speaker in this second segment, uh, Ali Sajed with uh, CGIAR. So please, um, you are maybe less familiar with some of us here uh, about this T7, T20 dialogues and perspectives, but CGIAR is also a very global organization. And I understand uh, that uh, joining the T7 and uh, T20 and perspectives has raised also a lot of interest internally. So the floor is yours. That's right. Thank you very much. And greetings from a small island between two countries that's producing fish improvement facilities that is literally the example of what we are just speaking about today. The funny thing is, is that our food systems don't know the differences between the T7 and the G7. If I went down to one of our fish breeding ponds here, I don't think they would know the nature of the water that they are in, only that it is nutritious and at the appropriate temperature for them. You know, it's interesting with that perspective that agri food systems actually could be a solution for this global issue in terms of, you know, our food, land and water system is responsible for 80% of deforestation, 37% of greenhouse gas emissions and 70% of fresh water resources. And with the right investment and the right science and knowledge and enablement, we could actually turn this destruction into a carbon sink. We are one of the few sectors that actually offers the solution by the nature of what we are. And to that end, it's about smallholder farmers, like my colleague Dil just said there, smallholder farmers, are responsible for producing a third of the world's food. And in essence, this is about building resilience, which isn't an international one size fits all solution. Actually building resilience in agri-food system is highly localized, difficult to measure, and really varied across different countries. And I would like to propose a solution here, and that is looking at the role of what innovation in agri-food systems could look like. And what I'm not suggesting is wheat here or water pumps there, but actually this landscapes-based approach. Remember, Mother Earth <laughs> doesn't know the difference between T7 or between the G7 and the G20. Thus, our approaches have to be as cross-boundary. It might look like developing drought and flood-resistant varieties of our food. It might mean investing in micro-irrigation technologies that go directly down to the small farm holder. It will be water harvesting techniques to restore degraded and damaged ecosystems. It will be developing early rollout of flood and drought warnings for people who live in vulnerable areas. It is index-based insurance. It is training and capacity building activities. Observe these cross sectors, they're all found at the nexus of agri-food systems, yet together they can be the catalyzing effect. I have one fantastic example in honor of our colleague here from India, who's going to host the G20. We had a great example recently in Gurujat in India, where with just 3,500 solar pumps, we connected thousands of rural farmers to the grid and then made a 25 year agreement with a local power utility to buy back the surplus power that small farm holders were producing on their own plots of land. What did this do? It increased it energy access. It created alternate income. It incentivized smart groundwater use and reduced carbon footprints all from two hectares at a time. The success of just this 3,500 solar pumps inspired a multi-billion dollar government of India initiative to promote regional solar irrigation methods. The answers are within us, and like Dill says, they are at the first mile of the agri-food systems. And I applaud the G7 and G20 to be thinking cross-sectorally and in systems. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And uh, this, uh, I think, gives a, a very good, um, not closing point, but uh, summarizes the variety of uh, issues linked with how to reignite, reignite 
uh, sustainable development uh, from agendas to geopolitics to actual uh, processes, not just uh, piecemeal project-based innovations, but also as large scale, as was described by Alisa, and uh, uh, reconnecting these long-term perspectives of growth and transformations, but also reassessing the costs uh, and trade-offs that are linked with that. So thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Alisa Jade mcdonald Bertel from CGI Air and co-chair of Task Force 3, Antonio Villafranca, director of research of ESP and co-chair of Task Force 4, Dr. Katsuo Matsushita, uh, senior fellow at IGES in Japan, co-chair of Task Force 2, and Dil Raut, uh, a senior research fellow at ADPI, uh, co-chair of Task Force 1. Um, we have la one last segment of our discussion that was largely uh, already touched upon, but that was expected, uh, both in the opening uh, series of exchanges, the opening statements of the G7 Japan Susherpa, and uh, throughout uh, our discussion today, that is about bridging the G7 and the G20. We'll try to finish uh, our inception conference on time, that is in 15 minutes, maybe with one or two minutes overlapping. Um, the next segment will be with uh, Rituj um, uh, from the uh, Rockefeller Foundation, uh, representing here Deepali Khanna, um, uh, Dennis Gerlich, uh, Director of Program of the Global Solutions Initiative. We're stepping in for Dennis Snower as co-chair of Task Force 2. Edgar Peterson, director of the African Center for Cities. Hello, Edgar, uh, in Cape Town, South Africa, and co-chair of Task Force 3. And uh, Said Munia Kasu, uh, director, uh, chairman, sorry, of IPAC, Institute of, for Policy Advocacy and Governance, and co-chair of Task Force 4. Uh, before we jump in our discussion, uh, Dean Sonobe or Professor Bang Bang, any, uh, any remark or any observation you wanted to share? Oh, Professor Bamba, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, please start. Okay, yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sonobe. Uh, thank you, Nicolas, for giving me an uh, uh, opportunity to uh, contribute. And certainly, I'm very much impressed uh, with the collaboration between T7 Germany and T20 Indonesia uh, during the, this year, 2022. And certainly uh, both have the advantage. I mean, the G7 will have the advantage of talking about the global issue with the capability to implement uh, the policies that will try to tackle the issues. While on the G20, uh, through the T20, of course, we know uh, very much the issues in emerging market and developing economy. And certainly with the collaboration with the seven members from the G7, then the G20 hopefully can find a global solution that also uh, touch directly the needs of the emerging market and developing economy. So I look forward for a very close collaboration between T7 Japan and uh, T20 India. Back to you, Nicholas. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much and for being always uh, so supportive of uh, such uh, both uh, quality, but also uh, bridging the, the, the G7 and the, and the G20. Uh, so getting back to uh, the last segment of our discussion, uh, who would like to uh, start first? Uh, there are a number of, of, of issues, right? Ranging from concrete initiatives that were taken in the G20 or in G7 in the past months. I'm thinking about the Climate Club, for example, about the Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investments, about the Just Energy Transition Partnerships, how to move those uh, major initiatives forward, um, and about Common Agenda, uh, T7 Japan and T20 India, uh, and um, also maybe about the role of uh, uh, multilateral financial institutions, which is something that is coming up also on uh, many tables. Who would like to start first? Maybe uh, Dennis Gerlich, uh, because GSI has been also a, a long-standing crossroads, right, of G7, G20, T7 now, T20 uh, perspectives and voices, Global South, Global North. Um, what would you recommend out of this experience and you being the program director of the Global Solutions Initiative for many years? Thank you, Nicolai, and thank you so much for uh, hosting us here today, uh, Dean Sonoba Kauri. 
it's a pleasure as always uh, to be together with you. Now, I think it has been stressed now many times in the discussion that the coordination between G7 and G20 is, is essential and important. And um, while in our presidency of the G uh, T T7 last year, together with uh, the Institute for Development Research uh, and Sustainability, um, we have, you know, started to work at this intersection a little bit of G7 and G20, uh, work towards this goal of coordinating these two fora um, and the think tank work behind it. And it's indeed extremely encouraging to see that this is now being continued and also as has been stressed by Samir earlier, that also India's G7, T T20 presidency is uh, is is, is um, working on this effort. So, with our Global Solutions Summit that will take place again this year on the 15th and 16th of May, uh, we would like, with all the previous presidencies, in fact, like to offer again a platform for the T7 and the T20 uh, to come together. In Berlin and to work with international stakeholders from business, from politics, uh, from civil society, uh, to work towards solutions uh, fostering this G20, G7 coordination. And um, um, yeah, I think this has started intensively last year and we hope to even more intensify it this year. Mm -hmm. Now, with regard to the issues uh, where I see a common, where I see common interests of both the G7 and the G20. And these are just examples of many, I think, but uh, I'd like to mention three of them. Um, the first one, I think, which hasn't been stressed too much in, in this discussion today is digital governance. Um, now, the digital gov uh, economy is growing um, everywhere and it has become a really intricate part of, of our lives. It's also increasingly a domain of, say, geostrategic rivalry of, of blocks and countries. But there's one group uh, that's typically uh, losing out in the digital governance arena, and that's the users, the consumers of, of digital services. Um, because there's simply not a well-functioning market uh, between what, what, how, how, how we give our data away and what, that we don't have no control over what, what is being done with the data that we give away. And um, this is actually causing many problems. And I think these problems are rather universal around the world, independent of the actual data digital governance model that countries are using. And um, so we would suggest, I think, to put this agenda of digital governance and to strengthening consumer rights to take control over data, uh, to put this highly also on the agendas of, of the T7 and the T20. Um, in a way that we empower users without stifling innovation in this sector. I think this is an, an issue that we should probably look at in both fora. Now, a second issue that we would consider important is a coherent measurement of well being or prosperity across the G20, which of course then includes the G7. Um, the transformation that we have to go through in all countries in the world mustn't only improve economic prosperity, but it needs to recouple it with social and environmental prosperity. And I think Jenny uh, has made this point very strongly before that we need social cohesion, a strong social policy as well, in order to, you know, have society backing the transformation processes. And one prerequisite for transformations to be successful. Uh, we would say is that we need coherent measures for well-being and prosperity across the world. That includes not only economic prosperity, but importantly also social, which we in our model would argue are solidarity uh, in societies and also agency to make decisions. But apart from social, also, uh, of course, environmental indicators that are distinct from economic progress, but uh, even more important, perhaps, to make changes. I see you waving, Nicolas, stop here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Denis. Points well taken. And I was also thinking about the issue of digital, digital governance, digital transformation um, that uh, should be uh, also part of our scope of exploration. Um, so 
in the next uh, seven minutes, I would like to hear from uh, uh, you, from uh, from Said. I know you are also a passionate advocate of the issues linking linked to the Global South to the G7 agendas. Then uh, uh, our colleague from the Rockefeller Foundation, Rituj, and then last but not least, we have started uh, with Egypt, and we would like to close our discussion with uh, South Africa, uh, with uh, Edgar Peterson. But uh, before this, uh, Said, in, uh, in briefly, if if you can, and I'm so sorry um, to 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 rush you just a little bit, and uh, uh, Rituj also Saul from the Rockefeller Foundation. Said, the floor is yours, and at uh, uh, 9 p.m. Tokyo time, I would like to pass it on to Dean Sonobe uh, for uh, a final uh, uh, final remarks, but also uh, very important information about the next steps of T7. Thank you. Said, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nicola, and uh, thanks, uh, Dean Sonobe. It's a pleasure uh, to be joining uh, friends and colleagues uh, at a rather interesting times. One of the advantage of being uh, lower in the tier of list of speaker, most of the people have said what you have, would have said, so that makes it easier. I'll just touch on a few issues which uh, uh, probably did not get highlighted. Uh, even as we speak today, uh, December 12th, 2022, the reality is uh, about 830 million people will go to sleep hungry. About 330 million people are in acute hunger. And World Food Program has asked for funding of 20 to $23 billion to feed 160 million people. While it's important we talk about climate change, energy, all are very, very important issues. Fundamentals is if you don't eat, you don't live. And this was not just exacerbated by the Ukraine crisis. Before that pandemic drought cyclone had been taking a heavy toll. In Afghanistan, parents are selling their children for $1,200 for buying food. That's the kind of reality we are meeting against. I don't want to send a, uh, send a sort of signal of depression, but I want us to get realistic what are the challenges we are facing. So food security is a big issue, which G7, G20 can definitely come together. And in my opinion, two things we need to depoliticize. One is food, second is medicine. We have seen what happened during the pandemic, how during two years, unfortunately, there was a clear lack of global leadership, whether it was US or Europe or China, nobody rose to the occasion. And God forbid there's a second pandemic, we should be better prepared in terms of responding. Third issue, given the time constraint, which also I think needs to be highlighted. I'm glad that our Japanese friend brought out this issue of uh, security and governance and peace. Which other country is in a better position to do that? Japan, because as you know, the only country which really suffered a nuclear attack 78 years back, when 210,000 people perished in a matter of months. Why I'm raising this? We have seen the specter of nuclear rhetoric uh, getting out of control in October, November during the Ukraine war. And Japan being very close to the Korean Peninsula is frequently uh, on look of missiles flying over its territory. And one little miscalculation can bring about disproportionate amount of suffering, which we should be careful about. Mm. So one is the nuclear, second is the non-traditional security risk that we are facing, whether it's cyber, climate migration, internally displaced population. So these are some of the issues which hopefully the task force uh, in which I have the pleasure of working with Jenny and Antonia will be closely looking into and bring some insights. So these are very interrelated issues, cross-functional issues. And given the small time I have, I think uh, given the fact Japan has chosen to make Hiroshima the host city for this year's uh, leadership summit, uh, let me ju just join me in five seconds of silence to show respect to those who lost life 78 years back so that we don't forget what happened 78 years back does not happen again. So that will be my initial remarks. And with this five seconds, I'll give it back to you, Nicholas, so that you have some space to accommodate other speakers. Five seconds, please. Nicola, you can take it over. Thank you so much. I think uh, our Japanese friend deserves this, this amount of respect. Nicola, back to you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Said, and um, I am uh, awfully confused because <laughs> we are nearly at the end of our time, but uh, I really want that we hear uh, closing remarks or final remarks from Rituj, so from the Rockefeller Foundation, and also especially from Edgar Peters uh, before the wrapping of Dean Sonobe. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, Rituj from the Rockefeller Foundation, how would you would see uh, a number of uh, priorities linked with this uh, G7, G20 bridging? Thank you, Nicola. Firstly, uh, I wanted to thank Dean Sanove and you on behalf of the Pali Kana, Vice President Rockefeller Foundation, uh, on whose behalf I'm speaking here today. Uh, I think three issues stand out for us uh, from the point of view of bringing more convergence between T7 and T20. And those issues are climate finance, debt sustainability, and multilateral development bank reforms. Uh, Clean infrastructure and climate finance are foundational to sustainable economic development and shared prosperity. A recent report released by the Rockefeller Foundation in partnership with BCG uh, suggested that there's 16%, that only 16% of the climate finance needs are currently being met. And emerging technologies in countries are, receive, are, are experiencing the most severe financing shortfalls. Uh, in this backdrop, cooperation between T20 and T7 is absolutely right. Um, at the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment event at the G20 Summit in Indonesia, a joint summit launching a just energy transition partnership was made. And uh, we think that this landmark partnership sets an example for us members of the four task forces of T7 to continue to forge meaningful relationships between T20 and T7 to pursue ambitious and just power sector transition in developing nations, supporting a trajectory that is consistent with the 1.5 degree goals. In its G7 presidency, Germany also advocated for a cooperative global climate club that is open to all countries expanding international partnerships beyond the G7, especially the G20 partners. We see the inclusion of countries in all stages of development and with climate policies of varying degrees of ambitions into the climate club as a golden opportunity to catalyze international cooperation international in implementing stronger climate protection plans. And uh, lastly, I think the G7 and G20 must work together to establish a fit for climate prosperity global financial system, building on the leadership of IMF, especially in the context of climate resilient debt restructuring, enabling special drawing rights swaps, accelerating public and private financing for energy transition, and allowing the multilateral development banks to increase their lending powers without diminishing their financial standing on their credit ratings. Mm -hmm. Daunting tasks lie ahead of us, yet we are hopeful. At COP27, a transformational change has been proposed to mobilize climate financing faster. Uh, for the first time, the final negotiating text called for the reform of multilateral development bank reforms and international financial institutions to ensure they're fit for the purpose to tackle climate emergency. We yeah, at the Rockefeller yeah. Foundation are, uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to invite uh, everyone to this dialogue that the Rockefeller Foundation will be uh, curating very soon to enable more exchanges between T7 and T20. We'll share the details with you very soon and uh, thank you Nicola and thank you everyone for this opportunity. Thank you very much uh, Rituj and we will also share through the T7 this uh, dialogue and mention also that uh, we are jointly uh, preparing uh, uh, future events including during the next uh, spring meeting of IMF and the World Bank on those uh, issues and that uh, the partnership with your foundation is most appreciated. Um, uh, uh, um, Edgar, the floor is yours uh, before passing it on to Dean Sonobe. Thanks. Thanks, Nicholas. And everyone will be so happy to know I'm actually three minutes late for chairing another workshop, so I'll be super brief. Uh, just to say that um, there is uh, there's a speciality, I think, to everything we're talking about, and this is really what I want to bring into the conversation. So a lot of our discussions assumes a nation-state frame. And the speciality that's required to see through a deep transition and just transitions and to deal with the questions of multidimensional inequality 
really requires us to rethink the governance problematic, not just from a multilateral perspective and a nation state frame, but to really think of the role of neighborhoods and bioregions as critical spatial anchor points to hold the kind of complexities we're talking about. A lot more to say about that, and it does resonate very, very well uh, with the kind of arguments that Alyssa was making earlier about how we can reimagine the future of agriculture and food security. The same applies to the urban transition and how we think neighborhoods and cities and city regions, when we've got to retrofit them and we've got to build them completely differently if we want to stay within the 1.5 degrees. Uh, my interest is, is how do we retool the global scientific system to both drive this policy understanding, but also the kind of experiments that can scale on the ground. So Nicholas, I'll leave it at that. There's a little teaser. Uh, uh, we'll be unpacking these issues in our task force. And thank you very much for this afternoon. It was most enlightening. Thank you very much, uh, Edgar. Good luck with your sessions. Again, sorry for this a few minutes delay and the issue of urbanization was well noted. Thank you so much, Tim Sonobe. The, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, very much to all co-chairs and uh, Nicola for this uh, very insightful uh, discussion. I look forward to working with you all for developing truly meaningful knowledge outcome that can address challenges as the world is on the brink of crisis. Uh, you know, uh, the, a large number of people uh, in hunger, as uh, Said Murir just uh, uh, pointed out, uh, but um, if the there are no uh, CGIAR, there are no science, uh, application of science to the global challenges. The problem would be much, much more serious. So the application of science is maybe the only one uh, truly useful uh, you know, approach to reducing the crisis, uh, reducing the challenges. So, uh, well, of course, the reality is very difficult, uh, maybe more uh, difficult uh, than the application of science in the agri-food uh, sector, because uh, we are facing the reality of responsibility, confrontation, conflicts. Uh, those things are more difficult, but uh, uh, like Antonio, uh, who is working on the science of this kind of problem. So we can have some science, we have some science already to apply, even in such a very difficult uh, problem. So I really, uh, you know, uh, wish to express my sincerest gratitude to all speakers and participants for your interest and support to our initiative. Uh, meaning the, you know, the very meaningful uh, bridge between uh, research and uh, policy. Uh, this is uh, our strength. So that's why I believe in the T7, T20. Uh, so yeah, let's work together. And uh, I'm very much happy to announce that uh, we are hosting the uh, T7 Japan Summit on 27 and 28 April in hybrid form. And you are all welcome to join. Uh, please. Uh, you know, pencil in uh, T7 uh, schedules in your you know, uh, schedule uh, or calendar. Uh, so please look at the T7 website so that you can receive all the T7 updates. Uh, with that, I am con uh, closing today's inception uh, conference, and I hope to see you all again and again uh, throughout our T7 uh, process. Thank you very much.